Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. The main purpose of Global Connections Television is to provide information about major international issues and the importance that they have and how we can all work together to work on these issues and to help create a better world. Today, we're going to take a look at the areas of education, science, and culture, and what one UN agency is doing to help improve our world by working on these particular problems. We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're going to take a look at the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization and what it's doing to focus attention on many issues and problems that impact our lives. My guest today is an expert on this organization. My guest today is Ms. Marie Paul Rudil. Ms. Marie Paul Rudil is the director of the New York Office of UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Previously, she was head of UNESCO's liaison office in Brussels, and she was also the UNESCO representative to the Uni U European Union. Ms. Marie Paul Rudil, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate you being with me. Let's talk about UNESCO. That's along with UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund. UNES UNESCO is probably one of the best known of the UN agencies. We hear a lot about UNESCO, but when was it formed and why was it formed? It has been founded in uh, London on the 16th of November 1945. So we are an uh, old woman today. We have 70 years as the UN, and we are the intellectual organization of the UN system. We are called to build the peace uh, through the cooperation in the field of science, culture, education, and information. We don't have to forget importance of information. Exactly. And you have a very famous preamble that is quoted quite often. It's rather long, so I want to make sure I get it right. But it, it's, since wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men the defenses of peace must be constructed. And of course, this came out of World War II, where 60 million people had died. How important was that and that preamble as far as setting the uh, setting really the, the markers for you, your goals and your future as an, as an agency? Yes, this was our goal because, in fact, the intellectual community discovered after the Second World War that we need to have the intellectual thinking together, in particular, you know, after the bomb uh, sent to, to Japan and the mm -hmm. use of the scientific research to destroy such a city. is questions were raised how to, to face uh, the use of the technology. So it was crucial for us to build a a culture of peace in the mind of men and women to use education, culture, mm -hmm. and scientist community, scientific community, to raise the attention of the world to say we have to take care how to manage our knowledge, how to use it properly in an ethical way, and uh, in s in the respect of our knowledge, mm -hmm. how to promote uh, a better world. Exactly. That, that's exactly what we should all be working towards, uh, creating that better world, developing a better world. And you have a very interesting website at www.unesco.org mm -hmm. that will have a lot more information on it as to what you're doing. Now, you, UNESCO has, you, you have the international organization, but you also have a group of what's called the National uh, committees, I guess, co commissions or committees, something mm -hmm. like that, for UNESCO. What exactly is that, and how does that operate in, in each individual country? Yeah. Well, it is a sp very specific entity that uh, is set up in each member state of UNESCO. UNESCO has 195 member states today, mm -hmm. 
and in each country it is set up a, what we are calling a national commission for UNESCO. For example, I was last week in Washington DC visiting the US National Commission for UNESCO. They are very active. They have the headquarters in the State Department mm -hmm. and uh, so they are trying to be the interface between the international organization and the civil society. So we, they are working with the universities, they are promoting mm -hmm. the ideal of UNESCO and inviting uh, well, uh, the civil society to promote our action and our knowledge. Exactly. And of course, there are literally, I guess you have thousands of universities around the world, in the United States, Canada, around the world, working with UNESCO as in on these particular problems and sharing information yes. and knowledge so that we can deal with the problems of the world, which yes. this is very important. We have, an, in particular, this uh, specific program, which is uh, UNESCO Chairs, which is a way to, to s mm, summarize this, uh, more important uh, research in particular mm -hmm. field of competence of UNESCO. Uh, so this is a way also exactly. to work directly with the civil society. It, it mm -hmm. certainly is. Now, you also have a program called the World Heritage Sites. What exactly is the World Heritage Site program? And maybe identify two or three examples. Well, it's not exactly a program. It is a result of a convention that has been adopted in 1972 by UNESCO. And the idea is to have a list of the most most important sites of heritage in the world. You know, uh, at this time, UNESCO decided to make a selection of the heritage, which is an expression of our cultural diversity in the world. So now today, this list uh, is a world heritage list of about 1,000 sites in the world. Of course, we are speaking here in New York, we could uh, mention the Statue of Liberty, but uh, we could uh, speak uh, of uh, so many wonderful sites in the world, mm -hmm. making uh, the privilege to be a citizen of the world. We recognize each other by the diversity of our heritage, but also by this uh, unbelievable heritage that the human being has been uh, capable to, uh, to develop and uh, to, to uh, construct. In, uh, since uh, generations and generations. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the Statue of Liberty in, in the harbor in, in New York City. Of course, there are literally, as you said, over a thousand uh, sites around the yes. world. A large part of old Quebec in Canada is part of the, the site. You've got Machu Picchu in Peru. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, uh, you uh, know. Lots of interesting places where I'm sure many of our viewers have visited. And when you're talking, what is the main purpose of this? Do you work with the governments, with the private sector, with the universities, the business community to preserve those sites and to be able to use them without destroying them? Is that the idea? Yes, it's a very long process. In fact, you know, when the member states wants to have the, a site inscribed on the World Heritage List, he, it has to come to the World Heritage Committee. Well, I am making the process very short for our interview, but we could mm -hmm. find more details on the sites that you mentioned. But in fact, so the member state is coming to the World Heritage Committee which is constituted by experts and after a series of uh, assessments it is decided by this committee which is uh, meeting every year if the site could be recognized for different based on different uh, criteria if the site could be inscribed on the world heritage list and of mm -hmm. course after that after the inscription the member state is taking the duty to co to make efforts to conserve this site as it is to keep this authenticity. That means that you, if you have, all don't, I don't know, if you have the pyramid in uh, Cairo inscribed on the World Heritage List, the member state has uh, to confirm to the world community that is going to take care of the fact that we're not to construct anything close to this site to protect the quality of the site, to protect uh, also the, the environment of the site. So. That means, uh, how to say, it is a, a way to recognize uh, the universality of this site, but also to ask the member state to ensure that uh, this universality is going to be conserved and maintained. Exactly. And on the flip side of the coin, you have the Man and the Biosphere program, which deals with natural, natural sites, uh, pristine natural resources. And I know in Kentucky, I can speak <laughs> with a little bit of knowledge of this, not much, but in Kentucky in 1991, 
the Mammoth Cave, which is one of the largest cave systems in the mm -hmm. world, was really ruining the water underneath the, ca the mm -hmm. water, the, the river that ran under, through the cave. The fish were dying. It was a, a, just a disaster. Mm -hmm. And they went to UNESCO, applied to be part of the program. Mm -hmm. UNESCO came in and brought together all the players, the federal, mm -hmm. the state, the local, the business community, the agricultural people, everybody, everybody involved in this. And they de developed a strategy to really clean up the cave and to preserve it for generations mm -hmm. and generations and to also help it to produce produce revenue, which is really an outstanding service. So you've got it, uh, the cultural sites mm -hmm. and you've got the Man in the Biosphere program. Yes, so this is uh, a program. This program is not based on a convention at the difference of the World Heritage Sites. So it is more voluntary approach. Mm -hmm. But we have this, uh, I think that we are more or less uh, 700 uh, biosphere in the, in the world now today. There would be a um, conference in the next month, I think next month in Peru, making mm -hmm. the point and the uh, assessment of the capacity of the member states to conserve this, uh, this uh, uh, biosphere reserves. And this is very interesting. I love this kind of a program because uh, it's a way to, to interfere between the conservation of heritage, mm -hmm. but also of the nature and to develop this site in a way to have the, the, human, uh, the human capacity to express its capacity to manage the site and to develop, uh, to, de to, to generate uh, employment, create jobs. And so this is really a link between conservation of heritage together with the economic and social development. Exactly. This, this is very, very important. interesting. And if our viewers have time, it would be fascinating just to Google the Man in the Biosphere Program sites. And in the United States alone, you'll run onto the, uh, w whatever, the Great Smoky Mountains, Mammoth Cave yeah, National Yellow Park, the Everglades, Yellowstone, just all yeah. across the board, not to mention hundreds of others yeah, around yeah. the world. But the, the, it is a very important program. It's yeah. an extremely exciting yeah. program. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, we're talking about pristine natural resources. Let's talk about the environment. A lot of scientists think that climate change is our number one problem. What is UNESCO involved in working with, uh, to deal with this problem of climate change? Mm -hmm. Did, were you participating in the recent conference in Paris? Not you personally, but I mean UNESCO yeah. at the recent conference in Paris to uh, deal with the climate change issue? Well, UNESCO is supporting very much this uh, Paris conference. Mm -hmm. And of course it has been a great success. In fact, uh, we are not directly involved. This is uh, res really the responsibility of the member states. But we are supporting the promotion of the, this agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, as you may know, that uh, this Paris Agreement will be signed officially on the 22 of April here in New York, here in this house, in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And so UNESCO is doing a lot because, of course, as you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, UNESCO is also the house for promotion of science collaboration among the member states in the field of science. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, into this direction to support the effort of uh, facing the question of uh, climate change, we are reinforcing, announcing our program on science, uh, research, education of science. So uh, relationship, we are developing seminars. We have organized a series of events on the occasion of the Paris conference. So of course we are a natural partner thanks to our mandate and our constitution. Exactly. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced, privately funded program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to the website, www.globalconnectionstelevision.com, and take a look at some of the previous programs. Also, if you're involved in any type of media outreach, be it a website, public broadcasting service, community access television, intra-campus television system, whatever it might be. And if your viewers would have an interest in these international issues, please go to the website and download our programs free of charge. We invite you to distribute them at no charge because Global Connections is provided as a public service. Today we're taking a look at a very interesting United Nations agency, UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. My guest today is an expert on UNESCO. My guest today is Ms. Marie Paul Rudil, who is the director of the New York office of UNESCO. We're talking about your agency and what you're doing. You also have a lot of <coughs> folks who are involved helping to get the word out about UNESCO. You have, I don't know if you call them ambassadors of goodwill or mm -hmm. whatever, but I remember Laura Bush, former uh, yeah. first lady, the, yes. or I guess, 
a former first lady <coughs> of the United States. Uh, you have Herbie Hancock. You have a variety of other people who help to get the word out about what you're doing. Is that correct? Perfect, perfectly correct. Uh, it is true that UNESCO have a series of uh, goodwill ambassadors, special envoy, and in fact, uh, you know, they are very uh, wonderful persons coming to UNESCO, offering to usually to our director general to help uh, using the names uh, and the capacity to promote our ideals. And so, you know, each of them is uh, involved in a different. Uh, uh, areas of UNESCO mm -hmm. and so we do appreciate to have this series of ambassadors who are really traveling all over the world and making our promotion. Mm -hmm. They are very helpful and this is a way also to better know UNESCO and uh, our challenge in this world. Exactly. Now another area that you wouldn't, uh, maybe you would think, <laughs> maybe some people would think or would not think, but is the, in the area of free press. And of course, uh, free press is really critical to uh, virtually every society so that the people in the country or in that society understand the issues, they receive proper information, they're able to participate hopefully in a democratic way. What does UNESCO do as far as helping to promote this freedom of the press? Well, we are doing a lot. We are doing a lot. We have the World Press Freedom Day on the 3rd of May that mm -hmm. we are going to celebrate this year, of course. And uh, we are also working hard for the safety of journalists. This is in the art of our mandate. How could you promote the, uh, the freedom and the, the security and the peace in the mind of men and women if you don't have the right of the freedom of expression? And of, of course, freedom of expression means press freedom. And you know what I mean. That means that uh, uh, you have the right to express whatever you want, and we have a mechanism to try to protect the freedom of journalists in each country of the world. It's not so easy, but we are fighting very hard. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it, it seems as though, especially with some of these conflicts that are taking place in Syria, Iraq, other areas, that it's becoming much more dangerous for a journalist to be able to do his or her work in a safe environment. It, 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 it's becoming even more of a challenge, is it not? Yeah. We have launched uh, with the UN, we have launched a plan for safety of journalists. Mm -hmm. So this is also an uh, issue which is a very, uh, very high concern for us. Because of course, how could you ensure the press freedom if you are not ensuring the safety of journalists? If you want to have uh, directly the photos uh, uh, indirect from the site uh, in a conflict, how mm -hmm. to ensure the safety. So working together with the member states, we are trying to promote this uh, safety of journalists, in particular in the conflict e situation. Exactly. Now, another activity you're involved is in is International Literacy Day. What is International Literacy Day and why is that important? Well, we are celebrating it at on the 8th of September. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not a good time for some countries because but never it, it is the day that we have uh, uh, it is a choice that has been made by the international community and it's quite important more or less we have more than uh, million persons 100 million persons over the world uh, who are suffering of literacy and so we need to improve our way forwards mm -hmm. two thirds on them are M girls, women, uh, access to education is really a crucial need. Uh, without literacy, how could you contribute, how could you participate to the world? In these days, it's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are making really, uh, we are focusing on this day to really to reinforce this battle against uh, lack of access to uh, uh, education. And uh, this is really a crucial day for us. Mm -hmm. It certainly is, yes. And it's a very important day. It's very, yeah, very, very critical. Important. This, uh, when we talk about journalists and their ability to do their jobs, do you, are you involved in any type of training for journalists? Uh, does UNESCO get involved in that? I know some agencies work to help train journalists, yeah. especially in recently emerging countries such as South Sudan, or maybe Egypt. countries not known for having mm. a free press, <laughs> shall we say. Well, I am not to make any judgment on the, the, the situation of the uh. press in any country, but nevertheless, we have to be positive and to be optim optimistic. So I think that uh, training journalists is always an added value to help to build democratic mm -hmm. system. 
this is a core issue. If you want to build democracy, you need uh, to train journalists. Uh, we are doing that. We are contributing to the training journalists. I think uh, in the Middle East the region, mm -hmm. we have done a lot, and we are doing a lot, even if today it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a core program of our organization. Exactly. Now, all the countries that participate in UNESCO benefit from UNESCO. They're all involved in, in the educational, scientific, scientific, and cultural areas. Now, as I recall, was it 2011 that the Palestinian Authority was accepted as a member of UNESCO and the United States, because of some law on the book, dropped out of UNESCO? It's, uh, what is the status of that? The U.S. is not become, has not gone back into UNESCO yet, has it? Are they still, are they participating, or mm -hmm. what exactly is the status? No, U.S. is a full member of UNESCO. Mm -hmm. They have been elected, uh, including on the occasion of the last general conference, they have been elected member of the executive board. Mm -hmm. So they are taking decisions, and they are taking decisions uh, every six months, uh, attending the meetings of the executive board. The problem of the U.S. is that uh, due to the internal uh, law, uh, they had to cut the funding to UNESCO in accordance to the, C C the legal system. W we think that uh, maybe there could be a pro in progress discussion about this funding. But US is really member of UNESCO today, and they are fully, they are fully participating to our decision, to our action, and they are very active in some way. So I'm very confident that the solution will be fine. Whatever it is, I think that uh, nobody could deny the importance to recognize the world heritage as a common heritage, mm -hmm. and including the American society, wherever you are, uh, to what party you are belonging, you are so proud to have this wonderful world heritage, which is sometimes called the UNESCO World Heritage. <laughs> UNESCO <laughs> World Heritage, <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is maybe a, not a proper designation, but it has a catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> it says it all. It pretty well sums yes, it up. Yes. So that's very important. So I think that that's probably a good good uh, moniker for it. To, to be quite honest, the uh, with uh, and it's also to in the U.S.'s best interest to be involved. It helps. It's obviously important for the other member states of UNESCO to have the U.S. actively involved, a hundred percent participant, and and it works both ways. And the U.S. was very involved in setting up UNESCO back of in course. 1945. Of course, and you know so we couldn't deny that the uh, intellectual community in the U.S. is very active all mm -hmm. over the world. Everywhere in the world uh, you could find uh, research uh, scientists coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so they are, they are in love with us uh, and they want more UNESCO. Uh, they are coming to us, including in New York, asking for us to, uh, ac asking us to, me to be more active. So we hope that uh, well this uh, current misunderstanding will find a solution to, to be very comfortable uh, to deal with the U.S. community entirely, in particular with the intellectual community of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And of course the involvement is so critical, involvement by all parties, member states, governments, the non-governmental organizations, universities, uh, the cultural amenities, whatever the case might be, cultural groups out there that have, have an interest in what you're doing. But you also want, I would think, we want to involve young people because as the saying goes, they are the leaders of tomorrow. Many are probably the leaders of today, but they certainly will be tomorrow. How can we get more young people involved in thinking about uh, UNESCO or some of these international issues that we've been talking about today, climate change, whatever it may be, freedom of the press, how can we get them involved uh, to be actively involved, to learn about them today and certainly be involved tomorrow in helping to overcome some of these challenges? Well, UNESCO is traditionally uh, a house for the young people. Um, I think that of course we have to support them, but we have also to listen to them. And uh, I think that uh, UNESCO has traditionally uh, uh, set up cooperation with the youth organizations and now with the youth. I could mention, for example, a project which is um, developed currently in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, uh, due to the conflicts, a lot of uh, young, uh, young people are suffering of lack of education. Uh, we're not speaking about uh, children, we're speaking really of the adolescents, students. Uh, you know, due to conflicts, as you have uh, schools have uh, 
closed are closed, uh, you don't have any more infrastructure for education. So we are trying to use this peer-to-peer -to -peer education through the youth organizations to, uh, to fulfill the gap. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in absence of education structure, we are trying to use this network of youth to, to train the younger generation to become uh, uh, youth leaders, mm -hmm. youth managers. So we are trying to do our best and uh, to listen to them, how to, to work with them and uh, how also to, to support them. Mm -hmm. But I think that listening to the youth is also quite important. Exactly. Well, Ms. Marie, Paul Rudil, this is a very important area, a very important agency that we've been talking about, and these issues are so critical. And we do need to learn we, so much more about them than we know. And of course, they can go to your website, www.unesco.org, and get more information about what we've been talking about today. And it's, it's just a wealth of information. It's a really an excellent website, but it, it's so important that we learn about them. But I want to thank you so very much for coming and being part of the program today and bringing, bringing me and our viewers up to date on what you've been doing. But thank you so very much for a very interesting thank and a very informative very program. Thank you so much for your, the invitation. Thank you. And I hope that uh, you are going to enjoy UNESCO. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm Bill Miller. Thanks for joining us today on Global Connections Television.